Hey there, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. I've recently been reading in the book of Titus a brief letter from Paul to Titus, who's in Crete. And one of the things that Paul charges Titus with doing is finding qualified elders in all the towns on the island of Crete. And the reason for that is to root out and combat false teaching. False teaching is everywhere. And qualified elders will help, uh, by teaching sound doctrine, help combat those false teachings. Teach what is true to overcome what is false. Now, I am no elder whatsoever. I'm not a pastor, preacher, teacher, any of that. And um, I want to also implore you to diligently search the scriptures to see if these things are so, anything that I'm talking about. But it is in the spirit of rooting out false teaching that I would like to uh, talk with you today. And so... If you engage with synergists, sooner or later, you're going to come across the negative inference fallacy. They're going to charge you with it. And it can be frustrating if you've never come across it before or if it's the hundredth time you've heard it, where if a passage says something in the Bible, makes a positive statement, this is the case here, and you say, well, because there's nothing else saying these other things are included, those other things can't be included. The synergist will charge you with the negative inference fallacy and saying you have muddled thinking, you have incorrect fallacious thinking because the, the scriptures doesn't specifically exclude those other things, so they have to be included. Which makes me wonder, thinking that they're automatically included just because I might have a, have a fallacious bit of reasoning, that seems to be yet another fallacy. But anyway, that's not what I'm here for. We're going to just talk about the negative inference fallacy, a couple of examples of what I see going on back and forth. Okay, and we're going to look at a couple of passages just briefly. So here's Romans, uh, not Romans, here's Hebrews chapter 7. And chapter 7 is that famous chapter of Hebrews where um, it is said of Jesus Christ, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is a reference back to the priests of Melchizedek. And this is where where we find typology in the Bible. This is the Bible teaching us typology. That um, in verse 15, this becomes more ev- even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek actually points to Christ. And that's a, that's a type. And that's a wonderful thing. So this is that famous chapter of Hebrews saying that Jesus has a role as a high priest. And this is why it's so important to um, spend time in the Old Testament to understand what these types are all about. But let's scroll on down to the uh, verse in question. So this was brought up at a debate recently where uh, I believe it was on limited atonement. Hebrews 7.25 says, Consequently, he, that being Jesus Christ, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So this is saying that Jesus Christ is making intercession for those who draw near to God through him. And that's a beautiful thing. So we have a positive statement of what God is doing. So we would say that everybody who believes right now, everyone who believed in the past, and certainly everyone who will believe in the future, this is by application, right? That Christ always lives to make intercession for all of these believers. And that's just wonderful. He is a perfect high priest. And it's a beautiful picture of our Savior in this wonderful role in our lives and it shows you his extreme care for his own now we don't see written here that he is making intercession for people who will always hate him and spurn him and then end up going to the second death that we see mentioned of at the great white throne judgment in revelations i believe that's chapter 20 and 
what will happen is a synergist, if you talk about this passage and this verse in particular, the synergist will turn around and slap you with the negative inference fallacy saying, see, you're excluding these people who don't believe and never will believe um, by a fallacious reasoning and you've negatively inferred that they're excluded. <laughs> um, and then they'll say, therefore, they must be included. Well, uh, something else is going on. Many of these synergists hold to a unusual view of God's omniscience that we on the reform side of things would not understand or have much exposure to. And their view of God's knowledge is that, some of them anyway, this is this is just very general, this presentation. Their view of God's knowledge is that there are some things he doesn't know with certainty. <clears throat> and so what what we can do on our side is, and I've heard it happen, we'll go to Acts chapter 4, where Peter... Uh, in the Spirit, preaches an amazing sermon, and he quotes from Psalm chapter 2, the Psalm 2, and says, Why do the Gentiles rage, and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then Peter actually uh, exegetes this, <laughs> exposits this passage for us. It's, it's really amazing. This is a great example of really of perfect preaching. This is solid because he's doing it in the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is guiding his every word here. And it becomes evident that God planned absolutely everything in Christ's crucifixion. And so we in the Reformed uh, side of things and who hold to God's omniscience as being completely certain, having no uncertainty in it whatsoever, will point to this, and these synergists will say, oh, but it doesn't say he plans this for everything. Now, wait a minute. Isn't that the negative inference fallacy? Aren't they saying that because it doesn't say specifically that he plans other things, that, um, that therefore he can't and does not? Now, this can be flipped on its head, right? So, both sides can accuse each other of the same thing. Because now, you know, we're saying on this side, well, yeah, this, this is an example of God knowing everything. <laughs> and they'll say, no, it's not. And we'll say, this is an example of God interceding only for one group. And they'll say, no, it's not. <laughs> so we're both kind of doing the same thing to each other. Now, there would be, there would actually be some validity to this if these passages were in a vacuum and we didn't have the whole Bible, right? Because we know that Jesus said he gave his life for the sheep. And who are the sheep? By application, the sheep are everyone who ever believed in Christ, everyone who does now believe in Christ, and everyone who will believe in Christ at some point. Those are Christ's sheep. He gave his life for them. And we have here in Hebrews, consequently is able to say to the uttermost to those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right here we have a couple of positive statements that say who Christ intercedes for. And we have many statements in the Bible of what God knows. And we could certainly run over to Ephesians chapter 1, for example, right and see that i think it's 11 let's see um in him in christ we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so he's working all things according to the counsel of his will right now lest i get charged with proof texting i know what the entire context is here. I don't have to prove from ground zero 
every single time I mention a verse, I don't have to go into exposition of the entire epistle or the entire book every single time we look at a passage. Okay, I am invoking the context <laughs> when I'm doing this. I'm aware of what the context is, and I've talked about it in another video. Anyway, or we could hop over to, let's say, uh, Romans 8. Yeah, I spelled it Romans. Anyway, uh, we can come down and we can see that uh, the famous verse, Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't just say the nice things, because these people you know, lived in Rome, the city of Rome. You don't think it was a picnic, do you? Um, but even so, God's working all things together for good, for those who love him. Okay, so we have these other statements that make it so we're not committing the negative inference fallacy. When it comes to God's knowledge and what he is making happen or what he is planning, let's just leave it at planning, for what he's planning and um, for who he intercedes. We have bookends that help us not go way out into the willy wags on stretching these texts too far. We don't want to stretch these texts too far. We want to stick to what the text says. Okay, so <clears throat> the negative inference fallacy will be pointed at you sooner or later. And it can be turned back on the person who is um, arguing with you. So what do we do then? Well, arguing on the internet is pretty silly. Um, I don't really argue with strangers. I, I am trying to learn this um, more and more. Trying to, anyway. But it's not helpful to argue with strangers. But it, within people in your own life that you know and that you can be an encouragement to, uh, these things can help you. And if they have digested some of the same synergistic material online that that you have heard, well, now you have a little something to go with. Because if they're going to say to you, well, you committed a negative inference fallacy, I think, you can say, well, there probably are times when you do it too. So let's get that off the table and let's define what it is we're talking about. Let's look at the broader context of Scripture and what it says about these particular topics, whether it be... Um, a limited atonement or um, unconditional election or whatever it is uh, you want to talk about. It could be you want to talk about creedal baptism versus infant baptism. Um, those kinds of things. Any, any kind of theological topic you want to discuss. But please remember to do it in love. Uh, think of Paul in Acts chapter 7. Uh, 17, I mean. In Acts chapter 17. Paul is in a city surrounded with idols. Um, there are perhaps upwards of 30,000 public idols in the city of Athens, I have heard it said. And that's a horrific number. I mean, it was just disgusting with the uh, idolatry everywhere. It was really visible, right? Truth be known, we all tend to build idols uh, in our own hearts every day, don't we? And we need Christ's help. We need the Holy Spirit to help us crush those things and destroy them and to stick with what is true. Now, Paul, while he does say that um, God commands all people everywhere to repent. He didn't start by saying, hey, all you disgusting idolaters. He starts with meeting them where they're at. And he, right here in verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, 
to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he goes on, and it's a great sermon that he preaches. And I want to just put a bug in your ear that God is... I think desirous that we try to reach unbelievers where they're at and not stand on a pedestal pointing our fingers down at them and saying, you filthy heathens, how horrible you all are all the time, rather than getting down in there and saying, look, God is in heaven and he created everything and uh, it is him through whom life flows. And in him we find everlasting life. And uh, I'm telling you this because God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And this being Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's just something to, to get you to think about and not be discouraged when people say, you've committed the negative inference fallacy. Well, I hope everyone is having a great day, and I pray that it is a blessed day. See you later.